Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, we are going to talk about something quite simple, but very important, experience. The reason I chose this topic for this specific episode is because I absolutely love this next guest's willingness to try something new. So, what is experience, why is it important, and why should an entrepreneur care? The definition of experience is practical content with an observation of facts or events. In short, experience is seeing and or doing something firsthand. Cinnamons for experience include action, contact, involvement, know-how, participation. But why is experience important? Simply put, ideas from top businesses tend to come from personal experiences. Take Starbucks as an example. Starbucks has revolutionized the way we drink coffee. Honestly, I didn't even know what a latte was, let alone I can add hazelnut flavor to it until Starbucks came. However, the Starbucks concept came from an idea Howard Swartz had while taking a trip across the pond. Starbucks strived to build its brand identity by offering customers a relaxing and enjoyable experience, like what Howard had experienced in the European countries. Howard's personal experience led to the creating of the Starbucks brand. Richard Bronson, owner of Virgin, wrote a book called The Importance of Personal Experience, where he discusses how personal relevance creates a commitment to the business. I have stated this before in many episodes. At the core of most businesses, an entrepreneur is trying to solve the dissatisfaction of a product or service. Steve Jobs didn't like the PC computer, so he went out and made one. Jack Dorsey didn't want to deal with Mark Zuckerberg shit, so he built Twitter. Heck, cryptocurrency is only relevant because we want other means of financial security outside of a typical bank. Businesses start with ideas that solve a problem. Identifying the problem is step one, but it is not easy, so don't let me sugarcoat it. Creating a business plan to address the problem takes knowing important elements of the business and the market. Background research is vital. Understanding the market segments, pricing strategies, competitors, consumers, supply chain, most of these areas are critical function areas of a business. The experienced gang researching the industry can help entrepreneurs determine early on if their business model will be successful. Ensuring there is a market for the business is key. In addition to gaining experience through research, tapping into previous professional experience and past learning will help support the business venture. Has anyone worked at the food industry, grocery store, department store? Those are all customer service positions, a skill that will come in handy. And don't think for one second working manual labor is not helping individuals retain skills. Quite the opposite. Skilled labor roles are not very easy to master. Who listening changes their own oil? yet another skill that is learned and mastered through experience. Even now, as I host this podcast, I'm gaining new experiences every day. Communication, production editing, social media, marketing, branding, all of these skills I am sharpening by hosting this podcast. And I hope it's starting to come out on the final product. Many people will tell you entrepreneurs are risk takers, but I would counter that. Sure, being an entrepreneur takes a certain amount of risk. However, Entrepreneurs take calculated risk, and the risks decrease the more experience the entrepreneur has in said industry. Today, my guest is an entrepreneur who has managed risk by gaining experience in an industry she wanted to learn. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the owner of Barreled B, Lee. How are we doing? We're good. I'm excited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I like honey. Good. But first, let's introduce the world to Lee Hedgeman. Okay. Give us a little background. Oh, yes. Let's I'm going to dig deep. deep. I'll go deep. Get deep. I'll back. <laughs> ah, first, the primordial ooze. I yes, I'm, I'm feeling it already. <laughs> oh, man. The sounds of my mother yelling at me. Let me, let me do some, should I do some background sounds? <laughs> <laughs> some birds? <and> t- <laughs> More like screaming and yelling. And oh, oh, my goodness. And then the clouds parted and there was thunder. <laughs> Right. That sounds we're, about right. We're, we're, we're falling off track so fast. So, uh, it, it's <laughs> honestly, I'm known to do that. I am a, I very much a tangent. I like to say, if you just hang on long enough, eat the ride, you will get back on the road. <laughs> I like that. That's, I like it. So let's, uh, let's introduce who is Lee. Give us a background. What, what made you an entrepreneur? What, what, made, what got you to today? Wow. That's a pretty um, deep question. Actually, I would say that procrastination got me to where I am today. <laughs> uh, I am, <laughs> I like it. but um, strangely enough, I am, uh, so I'm from Portland, Oregon, uh, born and raised here. Uh, my family has been here for a while now. So I grew, went to high school here, all the things. Um, I went to grad school, strangely enough, um, and was homebrewing in grad school as a procrastination and a stress reliever (laughs) to finishing my dissertation. So I started um, making wine and mead and beer uh, while I was writing and doing research for my uh, dissertation uh, back in the day. Uh, Let's not go. I won't give a name. I won't give a year. (laughs) (laughs) So so dissertation, what, what exactly did you go to grad school for? Um, I went to grad school for pedagogical theory. So my research interest was teaching and learning, and in particular, looking at how faculty of color um, use emotional labor as a method for helping them develop different kinds of teaching strategies to minimize the amount of emotional labor they had to use in the classroom to kind of keep their own well-being and keep sane. So Interesting. Yes. To this day, no one's done. Net, net, talk about deep. <laughs> to this day, no one's done the same kind of research that I was doing. So I always go, always go, you know, if I ever decide to go back and finish, yeah. um, then that's what I would do. Uh, that I would probably finish it then. Um, but so that's what I was going to school for. I was at the University of Minnesota. I was in the um, Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, um, the Feminist Studies program there. Nice. And so I was doing all these other things to kind of help relieve stress. So I had started brewing beer for fun um, with some friends to wait while all the wine I was making was aging. (laughs) And it got to the point where my advisor said, hey, um, we love that you are got this thing going on. Can you bring us a chapter instead of a six pack? It's not like we're going (laughs) to forget that you need to be doing this research. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. So... (laughs) Let's skip forward a couple of years. Uh, I actually moved back to Portland to finish my degree and to take a teaching job at Portland State in their women's studies um, and in the university studies department. So I was here doing that, looking for work in academia, and then decided that I didn't want to do that anymore, and I wanted to become a brewer instead. So I... uh, like with everything I tend to do, uh, make a decision and go, I'm just going to do it. And that, and it'll work out. Uh, <laughs> so I <laughs> met up, I had a lot of friends who are all in the industry and I met people in the industry and I actually started by volunteering. I like to say I was the la- probably the last person in the Portland Metro area who walked into a brewery and said, Hey, I want to learn how to brew. I'll volunteer. Um, and so I did that and I started, um, that is how I got my start in 2009, um, as a commercial brewer by learning how to brew in small breweries. And the running joke was, and this I think is the heart of my entrepreneurial spirit was that the running joke was that 
no one knew how many jobs I had because I worked at one time. Um, I had four different, I had four jobs at once. Um, two of them were in two breweries and then two were at the two homebrew shops that are here in Portland. Um, and I was hustling like crazy. Um, and I was in um, my late Oh, my mid thirties. What's going with that? Uh, <laughs> that is where the adage of working smart, not hard, comes in. Because my body was not going there. It was like, really? I think that the worst part of my learning and brewing was um, <laughs> I would my boyfriend then at the time, uh, who now who later became my husband, would pick me up from work, and he would have to physically put me in the car and put my seatbelt on because I was so physically out of shape and not used to doing that kind of physical labor that at the end of my workday, I was unable to lift my own arms to do things or walk barely. Um, it took months before I got built up that kind of core strength that I have now where I don't even think twice about half the things I do. Nice. So for the listeners at home, what is the barrel B and where did the, where did the concept come from? How did this all start? Cause this, we're not brewing beer now. No, we're not. So I brewed beer for um, almost 10 years. And then midway through that, I decided uh, I got a gig um, as a distiller for uh, McMinimins here in Portland. And I learned how to distill. And that's when I got really introduced to uh, barrels and spending time with a lot of barrels. Now, before that, remember, early on, I had been making wine in mead, which is basically Mm honey-based wine, and I was using a lot of honey in a lot of things. I used a lot of honey in a lot of beers I was making. So I'd always had honey present. And then you introduced the fact that I started working with spirits, and that was a whole new avenue that opened up. Now, how it came about, how the barreled bee came about, I like to say um, it started in a cider maker's kitchen with a spoonful of honey <laughs> and very clearly a, um, a friend at the time was a commercial cider maker and I was hanging out at her house and she's like, you've got to try this honey I got from Hawaii. And I said, okay, sure. So she gives me a teaspoon of honey. And I mean, she poured it out as if it was liquid gold and having tasted it at that moment, I was like, yes, yeah, she's right. That was a, that was a smart move. <laughs> We got the barrel B, yes. right? You start, you started it out. Now let's, let's talk about a little bit about the business piece of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, how, how let's did, talk about it? Cause I need some help. Here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're here to do. We are here to help. Okay. We are here to help folks. Now, first did you just decide the LLC route. Why did you decide that route? Um, I decided to go an LLC route as opposed to a corporation because I was, it was just me and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with this. And an LLC offered me kind of the more um, establishment of being a real business and not a single like entity kind of business, Mm -hmm. not just an owner or something. Um, I could name it something else and it didn't have to be a sole proprietor. There was a lot of um, things that I did not want kind of on my shoulders, but I also wanted the option to be able to move into kind of, um, to move to a corporation at a later date, but I still wanted the legitimacy of being an actual business and not a sole proprietor. Gotcha. So is this your first business? Yes, the first official business. The first official, but you you worked for many businesses. I've worked for many businesses. And and it seems like all those businesses kind of helped you get to this point. They did. Um, Not in the ways that are really helpful. (laughs) (laughs) Not in the ways that they don't tell you, oh my goodness, the things that people do not tell you. So- Funny thing is, I may, no, it was April 3rd was when I officially filed my LLC with the state of Oregon. Mm, okay. Um, and I just, I, and it was like three days after I had that encounter with um, that honey and mm-hmm. I was thinking about it and I go, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going to put different kind of honeys in barrels. I was like, what am I going to call it? I was like, well, I'm going to have to. I thought of names. I was thinking of everything. And finally the barrel beak popped in. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to file that. So I did that having no idea what I was doing. Yeah. And then I said, okay, well, I'll go to legal zoom. Like they must have a thing for setting up a business. And so I was like, well, what are all the things that I need? 
And they're like, well, you need a tax ID and you need all this stuff. So I was like, well, I'll go to LegalZoom. So I did that. Mm. Um, I was winging it. All of this happened within a couple of weeks. I had nothing else besides a name and a nice packet that they sent me. And I didn't have a logo. I had no, I had, I didn't even have a product. I had no idea what I was going to do. I just knew that I needed to jump on this. And the moment I did it, I said, well, there's no going back. And I, I just went from there trying to figure out how do you do this with no money? And I had absolutely still <laughs> <laughs> absolutely no money. But I also knew that I didn't want my home to be on the line. So one of the things, and it was also really important for me to be like, um, a business owner that was, this was my business. This was, yeah. wasn't a business with my partner and I and my husband. And I. It was not this. I had no one else. It was just me. So I needed to figure out a way to keep it as separate as possible. Hence also doing the LLC, mm -hmm. nothing under my own name. Yep. I needed to be able to have that separation. Um, I also needed to be able to have a bank account and all those things and have kind of the the ability to not, like, I never wanted to put my, um, I never wanted to put my home up for anything. Right. And so I needed, and I always wanted to be able to say that I was women owned. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to do that. Like you have to work twice as hard to separate yourself from um, a spouse on paper for a business um, because they just assume if you're married, then everybody is all included in that. Yeah. Um, and that is not the case. So yeah. I, we actually, my husband and I work really, really hard um, to keep it as separate and above board as possible. Mm. Um, so if, and that was one of the things I promised him was that one never going to, I'm never going to put up our house. That's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, he is never going to have to worry about that. Nice. And that's, that's a great learning moment for the folks at home. Real estate's a little bit different than the business world. And so when you buy a home with somebody, you, and if you're, whether you're married or not, and so this is kind of important, there's a difference between tenants by the common and tenants by the entirety, okay? Tenants by the entirety, uh, that means, you know, if, if you and your spouse, if some, somebody passes away, half of that house goes to your spouse. Tenant by the common means that half of your home or your split your home goes to your family, so like your parents and your brothers and sisters. The reason I bring this up is because this is kind of important, and this is why, and I, I don't mean to, no, derail no, I'm, this I'm, conversation. I'm listening, I'm learning this. But, but the reason this is important is because equality. Because when individuals are unable to get married, they buy a house as tenant by the uncommon versus tenant by the entirety. So when a uh, you know, significant other, when their partners pass away, that half of the house kind of goes to their family member. Completely different subject, kind of diverged, oh. but it's, it's very interesting because it's kind of thinking about that in the same way from the business perspective is you kind of want to create these safeguards, right? Yes. To, to ensure that it's not going one, once you close up shop, right? It, the money that you made is going to the right shop. Yes. And two, if something bad happens, they're not going after the wrong people. Yes. You know, so you, you mentioned funding. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. You, you say you don't have no money. Yeah. How, how did you start grassroots fundraising? What did you do? I started with, um, my paycheck. I would say, um, at least half of my salary every single month went to, <laughs> strangely, it still does, uh, goes to sustain my business, um, and went to pay for things, um, and I started off really, really small, and it was more of a, um, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, my mother would often, like, front me money, um, would buy things that I absolutely needed because she knew um, from the sales of um, merchandise and my very first batch. I used that to purchase things for my next batch and do all these kinds of, everything was done very piecemeal. Mm -hmm. um, and... That included, like, having business cards, like, all of those things. Um, I had friends who uh, believed, in the, believed in the idea and so um, would give me a loan that was a, they're like, 
we know you're going to pay it back eventually. Right, we right. see what you're doing. Um, no hurry. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm taking you. Trust me or I am. Uh, well, and that was, that was another thing. Um, and that's really hard. That's, that's a hard thing to kind of, uh, it's a hard gift to accept. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is other people's faith in you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very scary thing. You know, one of the things we talk about often on this show is the importance of like networking and collaboration, but not only that, the importance of like family and friends when you're starting a new venture because of the support they have, not only from, you know, cheerleading on the sideline, hoorah, but also from that financial perspective, how important was your family and friends? Um, my friends were completely, um, they were indispensable, uh, tracking down people, tracking down barrels, tracking down, I mean, having equipment, um, helping me move things, uh, helping me just, uh, just helping to keep me sane. <laughs> yeah. uh, my partner, he, uh, he handles and, um, all of our day to day. And so he would be, uh, he, he handled all my day to day. So if I don't think if I hadn't had him doing this, I wouldn't have had the time to kind of let a lot more fun, divert more funds from my paycheck to go to support my business. You know, but we're talking about honey. You, you mentioned you took a teaspoon of honey and it was, you know, gold, right? liquid gold. How do you make liquid gold? I, I, I don't know. I, I love eating honey. I'm not going to lie, but how do you make honey? What goes into it? Um, I do very little. So <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to do and that was really important to me was to network, showcase uh, the unbelievable diversity in um, terror war that we have here. Mm. And that is done. Um, that was done through Honey and working with different kinds of apiaries. So um, beekeeping companies. So apiaries they're either they either tend their own bees or in the case of a lot of the ones that I work with they work with other beekeepers and commercial pollinators and they purchase their honey from them and then then they sell that in various forms so they're kind of like a broker for smaller commercial bee pollinators gotcha so pollinators are commercial beekeepers whose sole job is to pollinate crops that need that and so you often see them talk about them on the circuit of um, when you see those big trucks that have like all these hundreds of hives on them, they're usually going up and down I-5, heading down to California. They'll be doing that in the next few months um, to start that pollination for like almonds and avocados. Mm. And then they'll gradually, and all those crops, and as the spring comes up, they'll make their way back up here. So there's that track. But then there's also um, the pollinators we have just in the state of Oregon. They're small, and they work with farmers, and they're just pollinating those crops. And so I'm working with apiaries who work with those beekeepers. And it was really important for me to be able to know where my honey was coming from because people were asking those questions. But also it's why I took up beekeeping was because everybody was asking me about bees and honey. And so I took up beekeeping to be able to answer people's questions. And that was really important for me. And I learned so much, like even more than when I was actually teaching um, and like talking about mead making and using honey in like fermentation process because it's kind of a different take. And my appreciation for that really did grow, but also the understanding that honey for me has always been this amazing snapshot of time and place mm. in the world. So it is basically liquid amber because bees have a certain, takes a certain amount of time to produce so much honey depends on and they their foraging is three to five miles so depending on where you have the hive you have a snapshot of what is growing what is um what's growing in the world right then and there based on when a beekeeper kind of what's blooming and when the beekeeper is harvesting so what would you say was kind of hard about starting this business because you mentioned you kind of were just on a whim started doing everything how what was hard about it or Fine. what was easy um easy part was selling the idea because nobody I looked at how many people were doing this and why and where and the honey that I had initially tasted was from Hawaii from a distillery that happened to be on a plantation and they happened to have bees it was just kind of a side thing they did and then I found another place that was doing something very similar 
but they happened to be an apiary and they had one distillery and every once in a while they'd get a barrel from them. I love those ideas, but we are really fortunate where we're at to have so many different beekeepers and so many different distilleries at my fingertips. And being in the industry, I had so many people mm, yeah. that I knew, yeah. like, hey, I, when are you dumping your barrels? Like, and when we say dumping, we don't mean dumping, dumping, we mean <laughs> emptying. Um, but like, we always, what? You're polluting? I know, everybody <laughs> says that, and I forget. I'm like, oh, sh- no, no. Yeah, you live in Oregon, man. You can't just say dumping. <laughs> I was like, when we say dump, we're like, we mean we empty our barrels. Gotcha. Um, and so... <laughs> So we do that and we, and, but knowing all these people that I engage with and be like, Hey, I want to do something really interesting. I love what your barrels, I love what your spirits taste like. Do you have anything? And people would just be like, yeah. So the hardest part of the, um, that was actually the easiest part was making the connections, getting the honey and getting the barrels. The hard part was all the behind the scenes paperwork, the bookkeeping things, the, um, contracts, uh, finding a space, uh, going through, figuring out what the legalities of what I was doing, since nobody was, nobody does what I do, um, how, and then how to position myself to talk about this in a way that makes it really interesting. Yeah. So finding a place because I'm dealing with a barrel that has hundreds of pounds yeah. um, of honey in it on, and it has to be on a rack and it has to be you know, movable, but you also have to have a space to work in that and finding places where I could share a space, use a lot of the similar equipment um, that everybody is using, like forklifts and yeah. pallet jacks and all these things. Um, that was the hard part because space is at a premium. So there might be some place that has it, but they don't have enough room or if they're not willing to kind of rent to you. And again, I don't have I didn't have any money um I didn't have great credit and so I couldn't get a business loan Mm. Um, you can't get a business loan without being in business um, and I wasn't in business long enough and then at some point your personal credit has to kind of yeah um but you know and because I was keeping it separate from my spouse and I yeah everything was all based on me um which is not which wasn't great um, and that was me struggling with how to be successful with this, but not starting out in a place that it sets you up to be successful. Mm, yeah. So I was coming from having no idea um, how to run a business, but I knew how to meet people and I knew how to make good products and I was a, uh, and I knew how to problem solve and play the what if game. And so then it was a matter of doing research and figuring out what is out there that can help me. Mm-hmm. So I found a lot of different programs um, to kind of help me, but some things just had to stay firm that I couldn't do. Like, you know, certain things weren't collateral, like, yeah. oh, you need to be able to do this or you need to have this startup money. Um, and I didn't want to take on investors when I first started. Um, for the simple reason, uh, which has come out four years later, <laughs> I was uh, I was afraid. I was afraid to fail and lose anybody else's money but my own. Mm, yeah, and that is a uh, I struggle with that, but also figuring out what's the best use of what money I do have and what kind of revenue I am bringing on and where where do I put it and how do you grow? Yeah. Looking back on everything, you know, from going to your education, going, tasting the liquid gold, the yep. amber. Now starting barrel B, mm-hmm. right. And going through this process. <coughs> what, what advice would you give a younger self? Oof, my younger self, like, yeah. Okay. I'd have to go back to my real younger self. Um, <laughs> the, the lesson of, just because they give you checks doesn't necessarily mean that means that's money <laughs> mm. <laughs> or, uh, you know, the things that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's be real. <laughs> We're going real deep. <laughs> <laughs> let's give that to 17 year old. Yeah, me. man. We, it's like, oh, hope nobody's listening on part of the authorities now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
where, you know, as a kid, you're like, oh, my gosh, I got my yeah. first track. You know, you got your first department store credit card. They don't tell you, like, oh, I can buy all these things. Like, yep. nobody understands. And they don't teach you, like, responsible yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, economics. And so we're like, oh, okay. So that, if I wanted to go, that's a real one. Um, but also to, I think the best advice is you don't have to do everything yourself. Yes. There Very is true. absolutely um, no reason for you to learn how to become a web designer, to learn how to become a bookkeeper, to learn how to become a graphic designer, to learn how to do anything that it is almost not worth the energy that it would take to learn something when there are people who that is what they do. Mm. And I've been really, really fortunate to learn that early on. Yeah. And I hire the people that I need for the job to do the job that I just, it's not the best use of my time to learn something when somebody already knows what they do. Very true. So that is actually, um, I offer that to, um, that is hands down when somebody asks me what's the most important tidbit of information that I could give them. That is what I give them. Um, and just because you think it looks good doesn't mean it does look good. Like it does pay to do your research. It does pay to not go cheap on things. Yep. Um, it is not a, there are some things that they just, I'll give a great example. Um, my graphic designer has, uh, I pretty much just say, this is what I want, and um, this is what it's going on to, and I want to have this kind of aesthetic. They already know what my brand looks like. They already know what everything that they've designed for me looks like. So I say, you have creative license. You're an artist. I trust you. Come with me with three ideas, however long it takes. Nice. Um, because you know what looks good for me. Yeah. And the one thing that has happened over the years is that everything that people say, the first thing that people see is going to be the packaging. Mm. So keep in mind, don't make anything too complicated if you're a one-man show, one-woman yep. show. Yep. Because if that's how what people know of you, that's what they're going to expect. Yep. And when you start to scale up and you're doing things by the hundreds, and you make it too complicated, you're going to have to hang on to that the whole entire time. I'm not thrilled by the fact that I love how my product looks, but I tell people all the time, I it takes me days, and it, it'll take me hours to like hand do everything that I do um, for something to look so nice and neat and clean. Um, and that is nothing wrong, yeah, but... It is what it is. Yeah. I mean, if I could have done something different. So just like pick and choose where you're going to spend your money. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's best to have some things designed, especially for you that nobody else has. Mm. And that finding other small businesses, um, there is a huge amount of loyalty that folks have from other small business owners yep. that when you're in it, whether it comes from, I have a guy who makes my boxes and my inserts um, and he has from the get go. And he does an amazing job. And I I don't think I could have ever had anything that looks as good if I was trying to buy something off the shelf. I like it. You know, and it's kind of funny. One of the things you mentioned was, you know, giving your creative designers kind of that ambiguity, right, to, to do their own thing. That is so important, you know, for owners out there that are listening, giving your staff kind of the empowerment to make the right decisions and to really kind of do the creative juices. That's one, going to keep them to retain them, right? Two, they're going to really probably going to innovate to the point they're going to probably make your business better, right? They're, they're going to create some new ideas because like you, you mentioned, I'm not an expert in graphic designs. No. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people right now. Hey, who? Hey, speaking of which, who wants to help me with my podcast cover? <laughs> I'm going to put that out there yeah. right now. Need some assistance, you know? And these are things that I know I'm not good at. Might as well, might as well ask them. So for the folks at home, where can they find the barrel B? Where can they find your product? Where can they find you on the social, online? Where, where's your information? Um, well, I'm the barrel B, and you can find me on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook. 
I'm mostly on Instagram a lot. I like Instagram. Yeah, um, I'm on is. Twitter too. It's so much fun. I love pictures. Um, I, I don't like to type, so I'm like that thousand words for a picture right there. That gives me. Um, but you can find me on my website. So everything is the name of my company. Um, so you can find me on my website. Um, so I sell online, but also local distilleries will carry my products. Um, especially if I use their barrels, I always try to give a shout out to them. Like it. Um, but you can find me at Freeland Spirits, which is actually my day job, and um, Abbey Creek Winery. Um, amazing collaborations I've done with Bertoni for that. And um, a lot of little small um, boutique stores. So Graham and Twos in Sherwood, um, Blackthorn Mercantile off of um, Williams. Nice. In North Portland. Awesome. Well, Thank you so much Lee, for thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.